Because I learned medicine in the 1970s through to 1980 when I basically made the decision that I wanted to go this way, young people were dying of end organ failure. Um, and transplantation fixed it. First time. Organs have failed, you die. Organs have failed, we transplant you, you don't die. First time. Fascinating. Um, so it was a really exciting opportunity to change the paradigm for people. My brother was um, fairly young, he was 36 when he died 10 years ago and he died in a car accident. And um, uh, he was a, a marathon runner, um, beautiful, beautiful person. And um, so we used to follow him occasionally, go into some of his races and, and whatever. And, and um, my father was uh, very much touched because he, what happened is they actually, I think it was an accident in a way, they actually were there with my mom and my sister at the moment where actually the organs um, were, had been retrieved and they were actually carried through the corridor, through helicopter and they would have been sent um, to the recipient. Um, and he was so touched by that moment that he decided to write a poem um, which Yes, I, I will read it to you. Um, I must say it took me about eight years to, or more, I mean now really, nine years to um, finally read it to people. I had very much difficulties. It's a very emotional for me. Night felt. We were painfully waiting, sitting still on our chairs along the wall of the long, impossibly long corridor of the intensive care unit. The waiting room was now empty, just us. Mum, Manuela and I. We kept waiting, tormented and anguished. Suddenly, from far away, we heard steps, the step of four running young people coming towards us. And when they got closer to us, we saw in them Bruno, Chiara, Balser and Roti and all the others, and with them, Mattia's heart. They were running so fast that they went past us in a flash, so that the scream, come on, Mattia, that so many times had encouraged him when he was running in Valsasia, got stuck in our throats, suffocated by our overwhelming emotion. But it was the tears that, falling on the ground, made the noise. It was the noise of a big ovation, an outstanding ovation for Mattia, the solar Mattia, the generous and altruistic young man that in an imaginary relay had arrived at the finishing line and was now passing on the baton of his young life to another young life. You're dead. Sometimes when you're doing drama, you think you, 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 there's a sort of a god of writers somewhere that, that if you just get out of the way, it's given to you. And, and the poem was a gift. And, and that was the end of the film. And the minute you've got the end of the film, everything else starts to fall into place. There's something about filmmaking that is, is, is fantastic because it brings together energy of lots of people with creativity, with knowledge, and, and you're all working together towards this, you know, possibly best outcome. And I, I, I love that process. And I was very fortunate to, to know through the Black Balloon, to know Tristan Miles, the producer of The Black Balloon. And right away I've asked him for help because I saw him working, I know him, and I know I could trust him. Um, and that for me was a very important thing. Being, being a very personal project, I had to feel comfortable with the people that I was working with. Tristan helped me tremendously to bring together the writer and the director. And, um, and that's how we started with this nucleus of uh, the four of us. This project is, brings out the best in everybody. I found that the responses, the help that we've had along the way from all sorts of quarters, you know, the fact that St Vincent's Hospital were prepared to give us 
an amazing amount of that hospital for three whole days is extraordinary. I mean, normally you would never get something like that, but people got behind this film in an exceptional way, and it's obviously because of where it came from and what it's about. We had choices to make, uh, and, and producers, director, writer, working together. Um, and we had to do a purpose-driven film that didn't look like a purpose-driven film. So that was an easy decision to make in the first place, that it had to work as a piece of drama. And then the second choice became, um, given the subject matter, this could so easily become a tragic, bleak kind of a film. And the audience would sort of turn away from it, really. And it didn't need to be that either. We then asked ourselves, it, it sounds like a dumb question, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful question to ask at the start of a project. We asked ourselves what's beautiful in this story. Uh, and it turned out to be nearly everything. Um, that it's about the generosity of the human spirit and the nobility of the human spirit and, 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 and the greatest gift. Even in the midst of tragedy, uh, this actually seeps into, all the way from the donor family uh, and the tragedy that they are facing and the decision that they make, all the way down to a tiny little moment where the nurses are giving their nail polish to the father of the girl who's dying. There is generosity uh, right through the film. Uh, and that's why, even though people are very moved by the film, and in some ways it's a very sad film, but sad can be beautiful, uh, and it is. If I, if I talk with, with my dad, at the end, when we think about Mattia, well, we think, isn't it wonderful? He saved five other people. Isn't it that the best gift that one person can give? And, and I think, so when I, when I hear that Australia is not doing so well with, with donations, I, I just think, let's, let's encourage this. Let's, let's talk to people. Let's, let's start a conversation. We know that we're missing donors. We know that there are that the conversion rate from potential donors to actual donors is maybe 40%, maybe 50% in this country. And country like Croatia, that conversion rate's about 90%. Countries that have high donation rates, the first thing that they do is they never ever miss a potential donor. They have systems that ensure that every potential donor is identified. We're getting there. We're not there yet. We're getting there. We put the staff in place around the country. Do they identify every potential donor? Some places probably, other places probably not. Do we have a system for measuring that? Yes. The second thing is to convert as many of those potential donors into actual donors. And that means two things really. One is the sort of organisational structure around it, and the other is the consent process. The organisational structure is mostly in place. Do we get consent from the donor? Well, if you're dead, it's hard to get consent. So the only way you can do that is you can register on the National Register. So that's your consent beforehand. There are some discussions about whether we should go to opt-out. An opt-out system means that you are a donor unless you've signed to say you don't want to be a donor. That's discussion going on at the moment. Some countries are looking at that overseas. At the moment what we have is if you have consented, then that's used as evidence to talk to the family. And of course it's much easier if you know. If you know that they wanted to be a donor, then it takes a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the difficulty out of the decision for the family. So we need to get those consent rates much better in, that in this country. The medical, the medical elements in the film were, the most important one was to have the actors understand the issues at hand that were in the writing. So in a simple scene, say, when someone says, you know, I think we should intubate you, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, the, if, 
it could mean you know, Shinji Bay, the actor could just say, okay, or all right. If the doctor says something, of course he, he means it. But the point is, is that you had to understand medically that that person would also know that intubation is a last stage thing. So when the doctor in the film says to one of the patients, Alice, that I think that we should intubate you, he's basically telling her things are getting very bad. And so I think that's where I guess my medical knowledge was useful, that I could give the actors an understanding of what that actually meant. It wasn't just, oh, you should do this. It was, we have to do this because things are really not going well. We had a very limited time for both the writing, we had a very limited time for the pre-production, we had very limited time for the production. I think the great luck that we had, we were able to shoot with a camera, the relatively new Ari Alexa, where um, you don't have to worry about um, latitude of a digital camera. In the old days, you know, it's like there was so many things that you couldn't do with available light because there's just not the latitude. You just you know don't save your highlights when you expose for shadows and stuff. These cameras are absolutely amazing. You get away with so much more, you know, and um, that was a real blessing. For heart and lungs, we like to um, have retrieved from the donor hospital and transplanted back here for heart in less than four hours and for a lung in less than six hours. Quite often the, um, the donors will progress to brain death um, any time of the day within a 24 hour period and we can't just sit there and say oh can we wait till the morning so we're at it, we can be at it 24 7 so sleep <laughs> deprivation I think is probably the hardest part of the job. First point to make about brain death is because I'm involved in transplantation, I can't make that diagnosis. So it has to be people who are neurologists or neurosurgeons or intensivists, and in this country it's mostly intensivists. There are a number of simple tests, and then there are some more complicated tests, which you may or may not need. So simple tests are to do with reflexes, which we know. Um, for example, if you poke your eye, you blink. That's a reflex, you can't stop it happening. And if you're comatose, it'll still happen. You poke the eye, you'll blink. If you pour cold water in your ear, your eyes will go to the side. If you um, push on the back of the throat, you'll gag. They're all reflexes that have to go through the brain. And so if the brain's not there, those reflexes don't work. So there's a series of tests that the intensivists have established and the neurologists have establish, established which define brain death and they test a number of different components of the brain to see if it's there and working and if it's not, it's not. One of the biggest challenges for me was how do you speak to someone who knows they are dying and knows they are dying soon, today or tomorrow. What can you say? Um, how can... And, and that is about as confronting a moment as you can have in drama and yet even in that moment and it is tragic and it is terrible what evolved out of the research and out, and out of all of our discussions was that there are different faiths and different beliefs and different kind of formulas that you could use to talk to people but but at the end of the day it seems that what happens is connectedness is, is, uh, and whether it's the connectedness of the Kershaw family who, who give the gift of life or the connectedness of Sam and Charlie, the father and daughter, uh, or more particularly, uh, in which case it was, a, it was a sort of a, he actually spoke of connectedness, or a, a scene that I love um, of the doctor and Alice when she knows she is dying and he does and, and, and he doesn't try. To, to, to say anything, he just connects with her and holds her hand and sits with her uh, and, and, and acts out, you are not alone. Uh, so it is tragic and yet even that scene ha has a nobility in it and, and therefore a, a degree of triumph in it. There are lots of myths about organ donation. Um, the myths of you know, waking up in the morning in Bali in an ice bath with a big scar over one side and the kidney removed. Every time I've heard that story, I have chased it as far as I can 
and it never, ever, ever ends in truth. The pressure on refugees in a number of countries to donate and perhaps sell their organs, those aren't myths, they're for real. The um, pressure on the poor by the wealthy through brokers, that's not a myth. When it comes to Australia, we got none of that. Australia, a few people, maybe five people a year leave Australia to go overseas, see if they can buy a kidney. In Australia, mostly, therefore, we don't have to worry about those problems. But the myths for the community are, I'll be on the side of the road and they really won't try because they want to get the organs. That's a myth. Organ donation isn't considered, isn't even thought about until somebody is in an irretrievable situation. And in fact, one of the problems that we've had is even when somebody is at an irretrievable situation, it's still not thought about. So identifying potential donors occurs at the end of the road and not at the beginning of the road, and certainly never ever at the ambulance. I can say, having gone through, that if my brother had not expressed his wishes, with my mum and dad, which we did earlier on through a dinner conversation. If he had not done that, I actually think that it would have been very difficult for my parents to say yes, particularly for my mother. And I, I understand that. It's a, it's a very difficult, intense moment. And you are through shock. And when you are through shock, your mind blocks and you don't think. And that is why it's so important to talk with your family. And your family, if they love you, they will honour you. They will honour you, your wishes. Yeah, I mean, in New South Wales, you can uh, tick yes on your driver's licence and you can tick the various um, organs that you wish to donate and there's also the register. Um, ideally, I think there needs to be one system that everyone is aware of and that, so that there's no confusion. Um, the register seems to work quite well within the other states in Australia. So quite often you'll find that they may have ticked yes on their licence or they may have indicated a no, whereas then on the registry they've said a yes. And so they have these conflicting messages. So I think ideally you need to have one system um, that is uniform around Australia. When my family saw the film, I, I, I actually just went back to Italy and, and showed them the film. I felt when the film was finished, I really want them to see it first. And for me, it was very important. And I must say that it was the most nervous moment for me. I felt almost um, guilty of bringing back all the emotions that they lived through 10 years ago. Um, it was incredibly touchy. It was my mum, dad, my sisters, my my brother, my my other brother, my sister-in-law, my nieces, and so it was a whole group of us, and we sat and we watched it. And when the film was finished, there was an incredible silence, and you know they were all crying, but they were almost crying inside. It was, you know, when when you go through that pain. Um, you, you honour it in a way, and th that silence, it really hit me and I felt, I almost felt guilty of bringing back that pain for them, but after that, they all recognised the film, the importance of it, and the beautiful way that it was shot in, 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 such, a, uh, in such a delicate way, without being too much of a big drama or not being taken seriously, everything was being considered, so they, they were really, really happy and they hope that it will help towards organ donations.